<laughs> okay. All right, we're rolling, honey. Well, how about if we start by just having you identify yourself? Right, I'm Clark Hitt. Uh, I went into the Army from Lancaster, Texas in uh, uh, August of uh, 1943. In which uh, division, now, the 10th Mountain Division, did you go into? I, I went into the 85th uh, Regiment Company K, and I stayed in the first platoon my entire service. I was one of the last two or three men uh, in the regiment before it was broken up at Camp Carson. So I, I, I knew the same guys uh, all the way through. Now, you had something unusual happen to you around Weaver Ridge. Maybe you could sort of summarize what happened to you. Uh, not, what happened on this trip? Not, not, not Reaver Ridge, but on Mount Sarah. Uh, uh, near the town of Piana Sonatico. Uh, we, it was our first uh, time in combat uh, for Company K. Uh, we went up to the little town of Antani where we relieved uh, another company of the division and we were in this village. This was in uh, February of uh, 1943. There was probably three or four feet of snow on the ground the Germans were on the opposite side of the mountain, which was called simply La Serra, in the town of Piana Sonatico. And we were there for, uh, I believe it was nine days, and uh, in a few patrols were sent out. Uh, some of us stayed in a three-story stone building. Some of the guys at night had to stay in a foxhole, the BAR men, the machine gun men, they had them set up around the village. It was kind of a 360 degree defense uh, because the Germans could come over at us like we went at them. Uh, although there really wasn't any chance for any major uh, offensive with that much snow and in that mountainous condition. But anyway, eventually they told us we were going to make a raid on uh, Pion Sonatico. Uh, I was not told, or I have forgotten if I was told, what really our objective was which I found out later was to take some German prisoners. Uh, we, I, it was uh, a, a bastard company, they called it. There was one platoon from each company in the 3rd Battalion of the 85th, with Colonel Sheeler uh, commanding. Uh, Captain Cooper, who was my company commander, was in command of this collection of, of uh, four different uh, platoons. Uh, I always figured just simply to give us experience and maybe to bloody us a little bit. And so the, um, we, we left out from Antani about uh, 11 o'clock one night. We had two or perhaps more uh, Italian partisans who were our guides who knew the way up the mountain. It, it's a very steep mountain, uh, not as high as a lot of them here in, in, the, uh, in the hill towns. Uh, hill area, but uh, anyway, they led us up, and, and um, the first platoon under Lieutenant Gene Hames uh, was to take the very top of the mountain and offer uh, uh, the left flank protection as the other three platoons moved up along the ridge, but below where we had moved up. We were up much higher, and we got up there like we were supposed to just about uh, daybreak without any fighting, uh, and uh, is a narrow ridge going up there. And so we were there and, and we dug uh, foxholes more or less in the snow uh, and uh, uh, sat for a long time. I remember uh, it, it was the sun came out and eventually I almost went to sleep sitting there. Nobody told us to do anything. I, I, on this occasion, I had a bazooka and, and I believe four rounds for the bazooka. Uh, we were in the trees, uh, which uh, made it difficult to see where Pion Sonatico was. Well, later we heard the shooting start down below from the other three regiments, and, uh, but we still really couldn't see much uh, as far as the Germans. The Germans mostly were outside the village, dug in uh, all the way around, kind of like we were at Antani. And, uh, the uh, fighting, uh, the, the, the shelling started, and sometime, and I don't remember the exact hour, but we were spread out in a single line facing Pion Sonatico. When down the line uh, came the word, Marasco got it, which meant that he was killed. 
uh, uh, the, the, Morasco had volunteered to go on this mission because he was in trouble with, with the captain and the colonel both. Before we came over to Italy, he had slipped off from Camp Patrick Henry, Virginia to see his wife, his pregnant wife, in Pittsburgh. She was pregnant with this Rob who accompanied us on this particular trip uh, about five months pregnant. And, and uh, so he had gone home to see her and he'd gotten back late. There's two stories about whether he actually came with us on the West Point, which two thirds of the division did, or whether he came on a later army transport. I've heard both stories. John Emery says he came on the West Point and that he was put in the brig for those nine days we were at sea. But anyway, he got with the company. Uh, I, I don't know which uh, version is correct, but, uh, and as I understand it, Sheeler, the battalion commander, wanted some pretty severe uh, punishment. Uh, Captain Cooper, from what I've heard, uh, was uh, a little more lenient that he hadn't really deserted at the front. He had, uh, he was just late, he was AWOL. But anyway, that's what Morasco was doing on the trip, on this raid, and, and he was from another platoon. And I didn't, I knew who he was. He was at Camp Hale with us, and then at Camp Swift. And uh, <coughs> uh, I wasn't a close friend of his, you know. You became friends with the guys that you slept in the same barracks with. And, and uh, so he, he volunteered to go on this raid hoping to get back in the good graces of the, the captain and the, and the colonel. So he, he really didn't have to be here, but the word came along the line, Morasco got him. Uh, the official report said that it was an 88. I, I don't know how they, anybody knows that, but an 88 shell, shrapnel got him. Uh, he, he was, uh, there was a medic in our group, I believe Danny Fantoni was with us. And uh, he did the best he could, but, he, but he, he, he got torn up pretty badly by that shrapnel. And, and up there where it was you know, below freezing, and uh, he, there, he was unsuccessful. He died pretty quickly. Uh, I didn't see him at this time. I'd simply gotten the word. They were, I was told I was a PFC, and you know, I was told to stay here until you get orders to do something else. And so I did. And, and it wasn't until finally uh, that the whole raid was called off. There was another man by the name of Honeycutt that was wounded down with the other three platoons. There were seven men in all who were wounded. And we got all the wounded off, but for some reason the two men were left up there. Uh, and uh, there's different versions on that, uh, whether that Captain Cooper was to blame for not ordering us. None of us can remember, we've talked about this many times, none of us who were up there could remember that, that the Army in our training, they were ever told that you, you're supposed to bring the dead back. It was very, very steep coming down there and then three or four feet of snow. It was, you know, it was pretty difficult riding. I'm not trying to make excuses. Uh, but uh, we got the order to, to pull back that we were going back to Antani, the village from which we'd come. And so everybody uh, gathered up their gear and, and here we went. And I remember stepping over uh, Marisco's body, he was lying on his back, and we had made a trail up there in the snow by packing it down as we went back and forth. And I remember his body lying over that and I simply stepped over it. And I thought at the time, this is a little disrespectful, but I did it because that was the easy way down. And uh, so his body was left up there. Nothing was said by anyone that I remember when we got back at Antony, you know, you know, why didn't we bring him down? We got all the seven wounded down. <coughs> so uh, that's, that's the story, and uh, as near as I can tell it, uh, uh, then this time in this visit here in 2003, in the reunion with the 10th back in Italy, uh, I met uh, Marasco's son, Rob, and his wife, Rita, and uh, found out that I was the only one in the reunion who was actually up there, who went on this with, with this first platoon. So they were very interested. Rita has interviewed me two or three times and asked me questions. Uh, 
about all of it, and, and I've tried to be honest with her as, as I can be. And But we went up this time on the bus. I think there were 14 or 15 of us uh, at, from the reunion who went there. We went to the Pian Sinatico. It's, it, it's as crooked, winding, hairpin trails as I've ever been on, including any in the Rockies or anywhere else in the world. And, and the bus, it was difficult to get the bus up there, but we finally made it. And, and there these people met, uh, uh, knew we were coming because Rita and, and Rob had been there several times and told the story. And so we met them, we got in cars and went up the, as far as we could. And then we had to walk, not quite as long as the walk on Belvedere, but it was, it was as steeper, steeper, and it was on leaves nearly all the way up, kind of slippery. But we walked all the way up there, and, and since Rob and Rita have been doing this, the village has erected uh, a, a stone-made marker, perhaps four feet high, with, with a, his name on it and, and, and a briefly about it in Italian. Uh, Rita and Rob, the son and son-in-law, uh, had a metal plaque of so big, uh, maybe 18 by 18, or maybe 24 by 24 inches, uh, a nice metal plaque that tells the story in English with Robert's name there. And uh, this is not the first time that the priest has gone along and he held a mass. There were uh, perhaps uh, 15 or 20 townspeople, local people, who went with us. So there was a, there was a large, you know, the 14 of us uh, Americans and uh, maybe twice that many uh, of the Italian people, and they were very warm, and I got to meet the man named, and I can't call his last name, but his first name is Valori, who, as a 14-year-old as a boy, found these two bodies up there, and, and he showed us where he found him, uh, or at least where he thinks he found him. I think he was a little further away, but, you know, within a few yards of it was where he found him, uh, about a month or maybe six weeks after the war was over. They, they found, and, and Robert's body, uh, Marasco's body, was, was taken home to, back to, uh, Pitts, to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where he had come from, and where Rob and Rita now live. So uh, it, it was, uh, uh, then, the, then the village people had a luncheon for us, back down at Cugligliano. And it really was as good uh, a meal as we've had all the time. And a number of the partisans were there and, and uh, they, after several glasses of vino, they really got to singing and, and we really had a great time. Uh, I don't know, we, I think we ate two and a half hours if the whole thing lasted. But it, it, uh, it showed, I think, the the warmth and the, and the real true spirit that, that most Italians have about us and, and their appreciation that, that uh, the American Army, not just the 10th Mountain Division, but the British and everybody, the Allies that were here that freed uh, Italy from Mussolini, uh, Mussolini and fascism, that uh, uh, all that warmth came out and, and it really was a great uh, emotional day for me to, to go there, and, and I had my grandson with me, and he got I got to explain all this to him, and, and I think he was very impressed. And from the top up there, I could look down and see Antoni. I, I couldn't identify the house that we were in, but I went back in 79 and did see the house and have a picture of it, which I gave to Rob and Rita, and I had a great picture, I thought, made from Antoni that shows the whole ridge that we went up. And uh, I gave him this, picture of the house because that's where Robert spent his last night. And uh, so uh, I think we developed a, a friendship with Rob and, and, uh, and Rita. And as you know, it was in Tom Brokaw's book, the, the second book, the, the Greatest Generation Speaks, which was letters in response to his first original book. And, and Rob has got to meet Tom Brokaw at, a, at some banquet. They had them together and he got to meet and chat with him a bit. Okay. That, that's, that's about the story. Okay. Uh, at the beginning of this, you said that you gave a, a, a approximate date that this happened, but you said 1943. And I'm I sorry. I think you probably sorry. meant... Absolutely. 45. Okay. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I guess I, I, I thought I said about when I went in the service, but I probably 
I probably said it on that thing. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> About 9.13 and, and, and kind of what I did this time walking over it. it uh, okay. I, I've told the story, but, but uh, well, I, I can add a little bit to it. Okay. Uh, are, are you ready? Okay, and uh, the third battalion was uh, ordered to take the hill 913 near just north of Castel Diano in the last uh, big push, the spring offensive, or October the 14th it began. And uh, we had been ready to go on April the 12th. Did I say October? I'm sorry. April the 14th is when the attack was. but. But we had uh, been ordered to be to the attack April the 12th, and that's the day Fra President Franklin Roosevelt died. And we all thought at that time that they postponed it because of the president's death. I don't know why we thought that, but we thought it. And then it was called off again on the 13th. And uh, finally on the 14th we kicked off, and, and of course we found out later that uh, the air, the fighter planes, the air base down near Florence was socked in with fog. And that was, and they of course did the strafing and, and helped us a whole lot in the attack. But anyway, uh, we, we attacked, uh, L Company was on the right, the I Company was on the left, and K Company initially was in reserve. Uh, I Company, of course, Bob Dole was in, and, and he was killed pretty early that first morning. And, and Wait, seriously, what <laughs> I stand corrected again. I, Bob Dole is still alive very much. I got to meet him back last October for the first time and, and had a great conversation with him. He asked me, you know, some things, what happened after he got wounded, after I told him that I went through it till the next morning. Uh, yes, Bob Dole was, uh, was only wounded, very seriously wounded, and, and almost died before they got him out of there. But, uh, so, uh, I Company got shot up badly, and, and, and so did L Company, and, and the, then K Company was committed and, and went through mostly L Company, uh, and uh, uh, the fight started that morning, and uh, we, we took the mountain late uh, that afternoon. Uh, one incident that's always been of interest to me is that that afternoon when things were really bad, uh, there were uh, dead Americans, dead Germans lying around, and, and uh, and they brought my squad on up to the very top, and, and uh, I heard the tank, one tank, the only tank that I was involved in the war, and the tanks started to turn the motor on. I went over and asked the guy, I said, where are you going? He says, we're going back down the hill. He says, we're not expendable, which uh, didn't help our morale at all. So that night, uh, all that I remember is my squad from K Company and one squad from another company up on the very top. There were no officers up there that night, to my knowledge. Uh, my company commander, I don't know where he was, and my, uh, my platoon sergeant wasn't there. I'm not sure where he was. I guess they had a good excuse. But anyway, we fought, took them out late in the afternoon, and then the next morning we were ordered to continue the attack. We, the barrage that we went under that night was by far the worst that I had ever been under. And, and the whole mountain shook, and it's the only time in my life that I ever grabbed a hold of another human being. My, my good friend Moldy Wakefield in the same uh, foxhole that we, we literally uh, sat there in this foxhole and, and hugged each other. Uh, you, you simply wanted to touch another human being. That was the, uh, because of the fear and, and because the whole mountainside was, was shaking with the art heavy German heavy artillery on it. I did get a replacement for my squad, but this time they had jumped me from PFC to a staff sergeant because uh, they had to have somebody, I guess. And, and uh, I was in charge of this uh, uh, squad, and they sent me up a replacement late that afternoon. And I told him to dig a foxhole back there behind me a little bit because he'd never been in combat. And I don't guess he didn't dig it deep enough or something. The next morning the sunlight came, he was dead there in the foxhole, and it wasn't over eight or ten yards away from me. And he had been hit sometime in that bombardment and uh, he, was, he was dead. I never asked him his name and it's always bothered me that you know, I didn't even ask the guy his name. But uh, uh, they, they always sent the replacements up at night and uh, you know, without any experience, he, he, I always felt sorry for them. Uh, uh, these fellows I were with, I'd been with for you know two years. 
and then so I, and you knew them, and you, you kind of knew who you could rely on, who you couldn't, perhaps. But anyway, we went on the next morning. We attacked, and on the back side of 913 was where I was wounded. I was hitting the shrapnel on the side of the face here, and uh, cut a nerve and cut a vein. I bled a whole lot, but I got back to the top of the hill. The medic dropped in the foxhole with me, helped me. He back, put a bandage around it, and then told me to go down to the uh, to the battalion aid station, which was a house on the road back down the, on the. Um, the east side of, uh, of uh, Hill 913. And I visited, on this last trip, I visited, we went to that house and hollered until the woman came out in front. She never did offer to let us go in. The, the whole battalion aid station was in the basement. And uh, I, I'd like to have gone in, uh, but uh, she didn't really understand English at all. And, uh, you know, she may have been there by herself, so I, I understand. but. But anyway, I ran to that battalion aid station, and, and that's where a whole lot of wounded guys were. The ambulances got to there and, and took you out. I got hit about 8 o'clock, as best I can remember, in the morning. And I got back to the aid station fairly quickly, and it was 5 o'clock that afternoon before they took me out on an ambulance. And naturally, they took the more seriously wounded at first. But then I went from uh, to about 5 o'clock, and I got back to the... Pistoia to the 70th General Hospital uh, sometime that afternoon, I don't really remember, and, and then I had surgery, they told me later, about 1 o'clock the next morning, and uh, I was there until just, uh, the war was just winding down when they finally sent me back. But back to Hill 913, this last time I went with Lieutenant Frank Slight's sister, who was on the trip, Gail Moray, I believe is her last name. He was killed on the mountaintop, and she wanted to go see it, so uh, I, I took her and, and another uh, person or two went, and, and uh, the mountain has signs up there on the top of it, you know, uh, entry forbidden or something. And uh, so, but we went anyway and climbed up to the very top, and, and, and there's still evidence of the German bunker is there, a huge hole, and uh, I tried, I could find my foxhole in 1979, but I couldn't find it this time. I, you know, things have filled in, that's a long time. But anyway, we walked on down to where I got hit on the backside of, uh, of uh, 913, and, uh, and just beyond that is a farmhouse that I had visited when I came in 79, and we went on and visited the same people this time. They invited us in their house, they insisted on making a coffee espresso, and, and we sat down and had a great visit, and, and uh, then she, uh, her granddaughter got home who could speak good English, and she came over and interpreted for us, so we, we had a really great visit. And come to find out, this mountaintop up here, where the sign said forbidden and so forth, was, is owned by that man who owns the house, and it was the German CP, or command post, on, on that battle. And uh, they had sent him to Belgium as a forced laborer, and his wife went back to Bologna. And, and they found the house in pretty bad shape and they got back, but come to find out, he owns the top of that hill, and the only reason he's put those signs up there is because people come in there stealing all of his mushrooms. And, and uh, you know, that's part of his farm. Uh, he sells them, and, and uh, so he was happy for us to be there, and he's happy for any other 10th uh, Mountain person to go up there and walk around. We, we felt a little guilty about going in when it said, you know, not forbidden. But uh, it was a great visit, and, and I was able to show this Frank Slight's uh, uh, sister uh, around and exactly how we came up, or at least how I came up the mountain, and. And, and approximately where he was killed. I, I wasn't there, I didn't see him killed, but he was a, a young lieutenant, I believe 22 years of age when, uh, when he was killed there. And so it was, a, it was kind of an emotional day too. That's, that's about all uh, probably from that. Okay, think that covers it? Uh, okay. And where are we now? Okay, uh, and uh, on February the 19th, the 3rd Battalion of the 85th was assigned the task of taking the very top of Mount Belvedere. 
and we kicked off that night, I believe, about uh, 11 o'clock again, and, and uh, the idea was to surprise the Germans. Nobody was supposed to put a shell in their chamber or didn't want any accidents going off, and we got on up to uh, perhaps uh, two, uh, 200 yards or maybe more from the top when the Germans apparently heard something. They started sending up flares. And I remember that we'd in training, you know, we'd told, been told that if the flare goes off, you just freeze. It's movement that people see on the other side, and those flares don't last long, but it was just bright as day. And I remember just freezing there and not trying to move muscle, and, and I had the feeling, you know, I'm naked before the world. That, that's, that's the feeling I had. But anyway, we, we got on up there closer, and these Germans uh, in machine gun nest, uh, after a lot of other fighting, tried to surrender by saying, comrade, comrade. And, and some guys from another company, I don't know who they were, came up toward them. Instead of making them get up out of the trench, they went towards them. It was a stupid mistake on the American side. And the Germans just dropped back down behind the machine gun and, and killed 13 out there. And uh, then when they surrendered, tried to surrender the next time, everybody fired on them, and, and they were literally riddled. So after the after we'd taken the top and things were, you know, nothing was happening to, for me to do, I wandered over there, not too many yards away, and, and, and looked in this uh, one German's overcoat and found a big, long uh, packet of, of pictures, you know, just uh, all sizes and shapes, which was of himself, and apparently his wife or his sweetheart and perhaps his parents and relatives. And I still have all those pictures. Well, I decided this time that I would, uh, I had Kinko's blow one up to eight to 10. He's a handsome young man. And uh, I, uh, I took that picture. And, and not long ago, I got a poem that was written by another of my real close friends, a guy by the name of Bill Bathless Bent, we call him. And he had written a poem when we were still at Camp Carson about this incident. This uh, uh, a poem about these 13 that were killed there. And so I, I took my two daughters who were on the trip and my grandson and, and I said, y'all are gonna listen to this poem that uh, Bathless wrote. And, and I had the picture there with him too. This time I couldn't find the, the, the trench but I have a good picture of it when I went back in 79, it was still very evident, but it's up there close to the top, but over where that open space where we came up, where the uh, grass had been mowed there. And so I, I, uh, I read that poem, which is, uh, uh, I think is good, uh, and, and, uh, and told the story about what had happened there and pointed out where the 13 were killed and. Uh, Later, you know, they asked us to help them load them on mules and took them back down. But so it was kind of a, a sentimental and, and a nostalgic time to go back to that place, especially to show it to my two daughters and my and my grandson and show the picture. And I've often wondered about the German, you know, his family. Uh, I've often wondered, you know, should I try to get in touch and, and send these pictures back? I don't know how in the world I would do it. They're, there are a few names on the back, but no addresses or anything. And he was a handsome fellow. And then, then some of the Italian partisans saw the picture, uh, Italian Alpinis, I mean, and they told me that the, by the marker on there that he was in the Luftwaffe, and that the Luftwaffe in the last days, and they had run out of planes, they turned them into infantrymen. And and it, there was the guy who was in charge, I think, uh, was a bald-headed man of about 45 years of age, and I suspect that he forced this guy, this kid, maybe he's very young, uh, but I, I have I have mixed emotions about him because they, they did something which was what we considered unfair by pretended surrender and then not. These Americans who were killed really had themselves to blame. They should have made them get out of the trench and come to them instead of the reverse. So, you know, but, but uh, I've often wondered about him. I've had this picture and all these other pictures, and I've often wondered about, you know, who, who he was. And, uh, and so I found out a little bit more from the, from the Italian Alpinis that, that he was, far, because there's a marks on his uniform that show that he was in the Luftwaffe. So uh, it, uh, it was an emotional place too, but uh, that's about your eight minutes. <laughs> okay, we'll stop for that. <laughs> Thank you.
So uh, I will have this picture at home, uh, and I will, show, I will show this picture to my kids. I am very happy to have you here. It's uh, an honor for me. And uh, I say thank you to everybody, to all the veterans to come here to the, today.